was awesome. Thank you. Um, so first, the scene of the crime. I walk into my room, and I am shocked by what I see. All of my clothes, everything I own, the bed sheets from the bed, and everything that was inside a bag is now piled on the middle of the room as if someone were about to light a bonfire. Imagine this pile of clothes and stuff in the middle of the room. And my first thought is that this might have been some sort of, I don't know, cleaning catastrophe, you know? Something went horribly wrong. Um, and then my second thought is that I was robbed. Um, and I was, but not in the way you would think. Nothing of value was taken. Only a few things were missing. My flip-flops, the book I was reading, an umbrella, and everything that was supposed to be in my shower stall. And then I have a third thought. There is only one person who could have done this. Although I didn't really quite want to believe it. I was in Abidjan in Ivory Coast teaching a class, a math class, for West African graduate students. The professors were put into this hotel, and that is where I met the prime suspect, who we'll refer to as V. V was a very sad, young, lonely, um, and strange young man. Um, and he seemed to spend a lot of time in the lobby just talking to whoever would pay attention to him. Sometimes he was even in his pajamas while he was doing this. He was the kind of person that like, doesn't look you in the eye, but he just stares at your shoes when he's talking to you. It's very awkward, but seemingly harmless. He's just very small, too. And um, one day I walked in with one of my colleagues, and I was speaking with him in English and uh, one of the other professors. And uh, V looks at me and says, oh, you're American? And I said, well, no, I'm Venezuelan. But I live in the United States, and I don't have an accent. I'm not going into that. And, um, and he was like, I'm American. And I'm like, OK, cool. What brings you to Ivory Coast? And he says, well, it's complicated. And he clearly doesn't want to say any more about that. But then he goes, do you have time to talk? And I say, well, you know, I'm tired. I, I sort of excuse myself, and I say, maybe some other day. I, I, he stirred a lot of sympathy in me. He was just, he seemed very in need of some friendship. And um, after this point, he starts really pursuing me for my attention. Eventually, because I have some sympathy for this sad young man, um, I have breakfast with him, and he explains a little bit about his situation. His parents have taken him to Ivory Coast from the US, and he's very unhappy about this. He doesn't speak French, and he would really, really like to return to America. And um, at this point, he sort of stops sharing details, so I don't really know what he wants. I don't know if he's asking for money, for help, for a friendship, um, and he doesn't really say what he wants, but he keeps sort of aggressively pursuing some sort of conversation with me. He wants to talk, he wants to uh, see me, um, he does this, uh, he, he asks me to talk at meals when I walk into the lobby, which he lives in apparently, and, um, and you know, it starts getting to the point where at some point he even follows me to my room to ask me, can you talk? And I'm like, no, <laughs> bye. And um, at some point, I really start, it, get, it starts getting from like sad and sort of sympathy producing to a little bit alarm bell raising, right? And so I, I decide, OK, I just need to ignore this guy. Um, I ignore him uh, most of the time. He knocks on my room door a lot. And I, I just decide to just put some boundaries. I've learned this through other bad experiences. <laughs> Boundaries are good. And so um, one day, I come back from work, as I did, and uh, my key is missing from the front desk. 
And B is sitting in the lobby, but this time he's wearing his nicest outfit, like the best shirt he owns. He's just sitting there. And he seems shocked about what's happening. Um, the front desk person uh, has a master key, so they let me into my room, and that is where I find the bonfire of my stuff. And, um, and I don't really know how to react, because it's very just jarring to see all of your things and, and it be clear that someone has touched them, you know, and someone has moved them. And um, I don't really know what's happening. From, from this point on, it's just like vague recollections because I was in shock. I don't know what was happening half the time. Um, but at some point, everyone in the hotel is in my room with me, like the front desk person, the manager, the cleaning person, the security people, everybody is in there. And they're also shocked. They're saying bizarre, bizarre a lot. And so I'm like, yes, it is very bizarre. Um, and, and they all have the same thought that I did, the third thought. There's only one person who could do this, and it's V. So they go to the lobby where V is sitting, because that's his space, and, um, and they go, where is Madame's key? You know, and he says, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I hear this, but I'm still like staring at my things, and then I start moving them around to see what's missing. Um, and then I see V walking past the, on, on the hallway, and I'm just like, I don't really know why he's walking down, down the hallway, like past my room. Again, he seems very concerned, very shocked. He's like, oh no, how horrible, this thing that happened to you. And he goes to the, to the back stairs. By the way, I don't know why these people let him go, but he's, he's just walking around. And he, what I didn't know at that moment is that we, he was going off to the back stairs to hide my key in a potted plant. What he didn't know is that one of my colleagues saw him do this. And this is the proverbial smoking gun. At that point, at first, I just felt a little bit defensive of him because I'm like, you can't just accuse someone just because they're a little odd, right? You can't just say that he's the one that did this thing to Madame's room. And so, um, but at this point, when, when we know that's my key, that he did it. And so uh, security has me over into his room. They've already messed everything up. It's a weird mirror of my own room at this point because they've been looking through his things. And, uh, and then I see it. That's my book in his suitcase. And then a little bit of searching, they find my flip-flops and my umbrella. And I just stare at him and I'm like, why would you do this? And he's just staring at the ground, meek, like he didn't do anything. He keeps saying he didn't do anything, but my things are in his room. And, um, and I say, like, why would you do this? I was nice to you. And this is the moment where he changes completely. He is, goes from looking at the ground to just looking me right in the eye. And he says, how? How were you nice to me? You did nothing for me. And that's when I know we have a motive. I ignored a man who thought he was entitled to my attention and, and that deserved some sort of retaliation. Um, and so, I, I, I mean, I'm just, I don't even know how to react anymore. I don't even know what I said. I just remember the hotel staff going, calmez-vous, madame, calmez-vous. And I'm like, I'm not gonna calmez-vous, damn it. <laughs> I mean, no. This is horrible, and yet it's really weird. And so um, I go to my room, and still, my toiletries are nowhere to be found. This kid keeps saying, I don't have them. Um, but he had all my other stuff, so I'm like, I don't really understand what's going on. Um, I don't know how, but V makes his way to my room again, and <laughs> he's staring, standing in the door, and I'm like, please go away, or I will scream. And he just says, I just have something to tell you. And I'm like, what? He's like, look, look in the toilet. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, just, just look in the toilet. And I open the toilet, and there's all the stuff that should have been in my shower stall. And I'm just like sick to my stomach, and I just tell him, you make me sick. Go away. And he walks away, meek, and you know, like, like he didn't really mean to or something. And and at that moment, I know that I'm giving him exactly what he wants. I'm upset, I'm extremely confused, and I'm giving him attention. Um, the hotel 
uh, staff kicks him out. They don't call the police because that doesn't do anything apparently. And, um, but I go to the police station the next day uh, with a friend and uh, we make a formal complaint. And there we learn that this young man, the week before we met him, had been in jail for a few nights for violence against his parents. We also learned that his parents moved him to Ivory Coast because he has a record in the US. We also learned that his parents deposited them in this hotel because they didn't want him in their home. So I had to deal with this kid. And so, um, and so he's not as harmless as he seemed. Um, and with this mess of clothes, I also had a mess of feelings because after all this information, I feel, I feel angry that this happened to me. I also feel lucky that the only thing that happened was that my stuff was moved around a little bit. I mean, honestly, that's all, that's all that happened. But I'm angry about it. I feel lucky. I feel worried because this, this behavior could lead to much worse behavior. So if nothing happens to this guy, bad things could happen to other people. And I feel really sorry for him and sad for him and sad for his family. And I mean, I never got a lot of closure from that. Um, I, I, it's been a year since this happened. Um, the only update I had from the police was a friend request on Facebook from the officer <laughs> that took the complaint. Um, so I don't know what happened to him. By the way, that's the thing in West Africa, apparently. I don't know. Um, so, and, and yeah, I mean, washed my clothes five times. I threw away half my stuff. Um, and that, in the end, it's stuff and it's easy to deal with. But I still have this mess of feelings. And that's going to be a lot harder to organize. Thank you.